Hi, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Project Pro's podcast on AI monetization in enterprises, uh, where we discuss uh, how business outcomes are achieved inside companies using AI, uh, particularly Gen AI. Uh, today, we have with us Charles. Uh, Charles is an AI engineer at Modal. Uh, Modal is a, a serverless computing infrastructure provider. Uh, for companies wanting GPUs to do inference, fine tuning, uh, or as a sandbox uh, environment. Mm -hmm. Um, Charles, uh, used to be a deep learning educator at full stack. Uh, before that, uh, he spent a couple of years at uh, weights and biases. Uh, and he also has a PhD in neuroscience from uh, the University of California, uh, Berkeley. Charles, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking time to do this. Yeah, thanks for having me, Benny, and uh, thanks for that really nice introduction. Absolutely. Uh, Charles, we would love to know uh, if you could just help us understand Modal, uh, the kind of the insight behind the company and the vision. Yeah, that's a, that's a great one. I think the core insight, so the co-founders are Eric Bernhardson and Akshat Bubna, and Eric worked at Spotify. He was sort of like, you know, one of the early ML engineers, like he needed to build out Discover Weekly, for example, at Spotify, and like a bunch of features that ended up driving like Spotify's success as a like as an organization turned out to hinge at least in part on the like quality of their machine learning. And what he found there and when he worked at a fintech company uh, called Better was that there was this particular type of infrastructure need that data scientists, machine learning engineers had that was like very different from what the infrastructure team expected to need to provide to engineers. So like maybe one way to to describe that succinctly is that when you like run stuff on Kubernetes, it's great at standing up like these homogeneous services where it's like, oh yeah, I want 10 copies of this thing. I want 10 copies of a database client. I want nine read replicas and 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 seven write replicas whatever you set that up and it's like self-healing that's like very nice but if you have like oh you know what today i need some a10g gpus so that i can run like this quick like hyperparameter sweep but i only need them for like six hours and then after that i'm probably going to want to run like a bunch of notebooks and i want to like analyze the output of that and that can i'll run that on a cpu um, oh, and then like a week later, let's turn that into like a little tiny microservice um, mm -hmm. running on GPUs. Like that's these, it's more fluid, it's more variable, um, and it is attacked by a different persona than the previous generation of infrastructure, like a lot more Python people, um, mm -hmm. fewer, fewer backend engineers, and, and actually also fewer front end JavaScript engineers. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Yes, Akshat had seen similar things at scale. Uh, and so they were like, okay, this is, this is the kind of thing that like somebody, instead of everybody like trying to solve this infrastructure problem on top of the clouds themselves, this is exactly yeah. the sort of thing where somebody can solve it once with us with a solid product and then, you know, sell that to people. Got it. Got it. And, um, who, what, what kind of customers are, um, uh, kind of the ICP, uh, model? Yeah, I think there's like two distinct ICPs. Mm -hmm. uh, one is startups and Series A companies that are like very like Gen AI first or or very neural network oriented. They mm -hmm. are um, they are part of their core product offering is running some big neural network. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're it's. You're running your a language model chatbot. You are running an image generation or audio generation service. Like yeah. we we see a lot of kind of like indie hackery types running like comfy UI uh, to like make cool little uh, image generation apps. And then also yeah. people bigger than that, uh, like Suno, for example, does music yeah. generation, and they run on Modal's platform. Um, yeah. Then the other like kind of interesting ICP more aligned maybe with what Project Pro. Uh, thinks about and works on is um, like an enterprise or larger, like more mature organization that has like decided, oh, wait, 
we need a Gen AI strategy. We need uh, this feature in like our product. Yeah. And they have like remit from the top uh, to tackle delivering that feature or or delivering a new product. And so they're like they're willing to try out like a kind of crazy new infrastructure product. They're willing to like run with this uh, like you know early startup offering something new. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. like um, rather than just going like rather than being like, oh, well, I guess we've got to now like hire a bunch of uh, Kubernetes engineers, hire a bunch of infrastructure people to set up this internal service. Um, and, you know, modal can help those people get started faster and get and empower their data scientists and and ML researchers and engineers to start shipping those features more quickly. Makes sense. Makes sense. And, you know, uh, you know, for the uninitiated listening to what you just said. The first thought that comes to mind is, um, I guess some some of what you said is available on AWS Lambda and services like that. So, how does one think about model and uh, was it something like Lambda? Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah you mentioned you, this earlier when in in introducing modal. Modal is serverless. So that mm -hmm. what that means is like rather than operating at the level of like virtual machines where you say like, oh yeah, give me a Linux machine that has this installed, like these packages and and like let me network it in this manner you write python functions and you say like hey modal run this python function for me mm -hmm. so server is also called functions as a service i actually kind of mm -hmm. like that name better but it didn't stick mm -hmm. um uh so the idea is like you don't have to manage servers uh, in mm -hmm. the same way that like the initial wave of cloud uh infrastructure was like you don't have to manage physical machines you only have to manage virtual machines yeah um so, yeah, so there, so modal is not the first like tool in this category, the first like, uh, uh, approach to serverless functions. So yeah, AWS Lambda is, uh, is AWS's offering for server, for functions as a service, uh, serverless execution. It's also mm -hmm. Google Cloud Run, um, Cloudflare workers, a bunch of things out there. One of the mm -hmm. primary differences with modal, there's a couple things. Mm -hmm. One is like GPU acceleration. It's very mm -hmm. like, I don't believe any of the public clouds have generally available GPU acceleration for functions. Um, and then in addition, the initial use case for functions as a service was like, oh, I'm running my web app and I have like a database server. I have these like various like, you know, core components of my application. And then, oh, there's these like little things I might want to do on the side sometimes. I might want to like, you know, add some, add some elements to a request or response body. I might want to like kick it off to a function that like sends it to a data lake like these sort of like peripheral activities that frequently involve like very small amounts of data and, mm -hmm. and we're like extremely latency sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, but with machine learning uh, applications with many like, yeah, data science applications and especially with this latest collection of large pre-trained models, mm -hmm. it becomes actually much larger data in or much larger data out and much heavier computation. Mm -hmm. And the like architecture of AW of, of, cloud functions from the public clouds generally doesn't support this mm -hmm. um, like re respond like maximum time lengths maximum image sizes like like limitations on headers like just all kinds of like kind of in the weeds technical details that just make it uh like yeah. a product designed for a different type of workload mm -hmm, mm -hmm. makes sense and you know for such developers is, is modal just focus on the infrastructure part of it or are there also kind of out of the box plug and play more kind of foundation models or you know pre-trained models and things like that available on top of the intra yeah so we have a bunch of like examples this mm -hmm. is like one of the core things that i end up working on as sort of like you know somebody who's been doing education and doing sort of like deployment in ml for the last uh like five years mm -hmm. it's like my role is to make sure that the platform works well for deploying these models and mm -hmm. to show people how to do it, to do some solutions architecting with people on like, okay, here's how you would run this Got server it. and your stuff. But uh -huh. that's different. We don't attempt to offer like inference as a service. Mm -hmm. um, the way this is like kind of distinct. There are lots of other people who are offering inference as a service. There's a number of like early startups where like they're, like roughly doing the same thing that somebody something somebody like OpenAI or Anthropic is doing, where it's like, oh, just hit our API endpoints and you get 
model completions back. It's like intelligence as a service or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is, um, uh, yeah. So Modal is offering the like infrastructure as a service or functions as a service. Yeah. And the thing that I liked about that, looking around, I joined the company only about six months ago after being a user for like a, a very happy user posting wow. about the monthly media for like a year wow. or more. Oh, wow. That. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and the like appeal of that to me was that I could stand up a model service. I could put up another web server. I could write a little database client. I could create a front end in Python and I can do that and then run like ETL jobs and hyperparameter sweeps all within one single like coherent system mm-hmm. uh, without having to write a bunch of YAML, without having to like wrestle with IAM and security policies. Um, mm-hmm. And that felt more powerful to me than just like, oh, well, you know, oh, that's cool. Like I can run, I can get Llama 3 inference from some inference service like together or replicate, um, but rather have like full control over the infrastructure and how the model runs and mm-hmm. things like that. That's, that's very interesting. It's always great to hear someone who's been using the product as a customer for a while, uh, kind of fall in love with it, and then eventually uh, join the uh, company. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's it's, it's, it's very interesting. So, um, and are there specific types of companies, for example, gaming companies or voice-based companies that seem to benefit more from a service like this today? Yeah, I'd say the folks who benefit most from this service right now are people mm-hmm. who are doing media generation, in particular image generation and audio generation. Mm-hmm. And one reason for that is the level of quality of open models, mm-hmm. uh, especially for image generation. Like with language models, the the like best models have been proprietary for some time, right? Mm-hmm. It was initially GPT-3. In fact, GPT-2, the weights were not initially released. And then GPT-3, the weights were not released. Um, and since since that point, uh, we have not had the like premier, the like highest quality language model weights have not been publicly available. Uh, that's quite different from image generation where the like state, the like stable diffusion weights were released. Yeah. Um, and that was like, uh, one of the best models, if not the best model. Like there had been some like researchy demos, but nothing that was available as a service the way that GPT-3 mm-hmm. was. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's like that has led to a very mature ecosystem for running these models. People have like, it's not just that people want to like put in a text string and get out an image. Like they don't want to consume it like a service. They want to consume it like a tool. They want to say, oh, I want to like hook up a control net to it. That like is this distinct module that says that like injects a little bit of information to the model. That's like generate an image of marshmallows in the shape of my logo. Right. Mm -hmm. But But instead of that just being in text, you inject the logo into the model and sort of like force it to generate in that shape. If you've seen these like jet, like kind of these went viral like about a year ago, I think, where I people see. were generating like QR codes using yeah. this. The QR mm-hmm. code is like made of marshmallows. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the kind of thing that the image generation community, because the open source components are more mature and more like were and have been more useful for longer, they've mm-hmm. developed more complex workflows. Language models are catching up now with like grammar based decoding, with like more complex decoding from language models in general, like search based decoding, um, bootstrapping, uh, consensus, uh, like, and then yeah, low rank adapters, various different types of adapters. There's Mm -hmm. like, we're starting to see sort of like spearheaded by Llama and additionally like DBRX and Arctic, uh, from Databricks and and Snowflake, high quality. Uh, open source language models with complex like that support like very complex inference and uh workflows and that's yeah. something that uh you know modal can support uh yeah. for for your you know in a way that like an inference service provider will struggle got it got it makes sense and you know uh given that you were a deep learning educator before and you're a machine learning engineer now and you just kind of gave up a list of models and components and things like that right now, right? So a novice enterprise data scientist, machine learning engineer beginning to solve a use case, how mm-hmm. do they look at what foundation model to pick 
uh, uh, what tool stack to pick? How do they make those decisions given that things are changing on a weekly basis? Yeah, definitely. It is challenging. I find like, yeah, I just have to kind of keep up with the fire hose of information from Twitter. Um, there, yeah, there's a couple of good sources for like keeping up with stuff. Um, so I've kind of like curated people who I like to follow on Twitter. Um, so a bunch of them, we ended up writing a, a paper recently, me and some friends from, uh, who like to post about this on Twitter. So that's, um, if you go to applied hyphen LLNs.org, we have like a lo- like long kind of white paper that's talks about everything from like what we think the right prompting strategies are, these sort of like very tactical, low level mm-hmm. considerations, all the way up to strategic questions of like, how do you pick a model and how should you, how should you construct a team to deliver these kinds of, uh, um, features? Oh, very, and- very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, like some of the TLDRs that come out of that is like the most important components are not the models, but rather the, uh, like data and evaluations. Mm -hmm. So if you have a good way to determine whether the system is operating correctly, whether Mm -hmm. the outcomes in a system are high quality, then Mm -hmm. when a new model comes out, Mm -hmm. you can just simply swap that component out and see whether it performs well. Yeah. Uh, and it's actually turning out to be like, databases are notoriously very hard to swap in and out, right? Like mm-hmm. ISO SQL aside, it's like not really the case that you can just, somebody releases a new database that's better and you just switch your database engine and all of a sudden like performance gets better or whatever. There's like yeah. in, in intense gravity to databases. But mm-hmm. models have not really evinced the same gravity. It's like, you can, if like Claude 3 five Sonnet, like, that came out a couple weeks ago. People were like, oh, this is actually better than GPD 4.0 for a mm-hmm. bunch of the like, use cases and cheaper. It's like mm-hmm. a, you know, per, like strict improvement and they could switch it. But you can only do that if you have the ability to evaluate outputs. And the right. ability to evaluate outputs generally comes from having collected data and having, col- uh, in, and that you can like run your evaluations on mm-hmm. and having collected, um, or curated like, kind of tests like specific failure modes to look for that are very common or uh, specific like features of outputs often distilled from data distilled from experience working with the system so i'd say it's like data scientist personas are actually quite good at that they're like quite good at thinking about evaluation software engineers people who are coming to llm engineering or ai engineering without that data centric data scientist background might not know how to do that might not have those tools ready might not have those instincts but data yeah. scientists frequently do and then you can catch up on whether it's quen 27b or gemma 2 or uh gemma 2 27b or quen or whatever is the like latest hottest model and slip that in to your pipeline mm-hmm. um relatively straightforwardly got it got it i have a couple of uh, follow-on questions to that mm-hmm. uh, uh charles so the first one is uh from the uh, angle of assessing model quality, right? The, the, the output of it. I, I guess one of the criteria is, you know, how well the model has been fine-tuned to the specific use, use case you're working on, right? How much does a role of synthetic data play in that today uh, from what yeah. you're seeing? Yeah. So one quick point of clarification, mm-hmm. like people usually use the word fine-tune to mean mm-hmm. that you have like updated the model. Right. Like mm-hmm. people create these foundation models that we can build our applications on. Yeah. Uh, then if you the way that they do that is generally, you know, gradient descent, there's calculus involved. Right. If, and that optimization process, if you repeat that in some way when deploying your application, people call that fine tuning. Mm-hmm. And you generally have to customize something about models like you're going to write your own prompts. Right. Mm-hmm. You're going to like, you aren't just going to like give the model directly to your users. You're going to write a ret- an information retrieval system to like help the model create more useful generations. Yeah. You might this, this, do this flow engineering. All those are like customizations that make mm-hmm. the model possibly more useful for your task, mm-hmm. but they aren't fine tuning. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I just wanted to check to make sure just because that's an important, that's like an important change. Like a data scientist or ML engineer might have the instinct to start mm-hmm. fine tuning. Mm-hmm like coming from a like from the quality of foundation models that we had seven years ago Mm -hmm. um but the like foundation the like pre-trained models that we have now you can get quite far without fine-tuning them 
And you, so you should be developing your like initial prototypes of your application and your initial like evaluations of quality without ever passing a gradient because the complexity, like the complexity 10 X's once you start needing to do like actual fine tuning. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. So, and since these models, unlike regular software programming, work in a stochastic output kind of way rather than more deterministic, how do you benchmark the output? Is it always a human going to benchmark it? How do you benchmark the output against what's right, what's not? Yeah, that's actually another kind of interesting point. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of what... It, except for some corner cases, which mm -hmm. is always the case with, with hardware and software, mm -hmm. the models are actually deterministic. If you set them to temperature zero, Mm -hmm. which is like remove like it's like absolute zero in a physical system it removes all randomness um then the model's behavior should be deterministic mm -hmm. so the problem i think it's like a little bit subtler than non-determinism mm -hmm. which usually mm -hmm. means there's like information you don't have access to mm -hmm. um it's it's that we have trouble predicting their behavior with traditional mm -hmm. software you can simply like frequently just examine the types and you know stuff about unicode byte streams there's a spec you know stuff about integers and their behavior. And so you can guarantee that the program will behave correctly. Or you mm -hmm. can convince yourself that the program will behave correctly on all inputs by trying mm -hmm. a small number of inputs, observing the outputs, and like reifying that as tests. Mm -hmm. But that's not the so that is it's true that that's not the way LLMs work because mm -hmm. we are very bad at predicting their behavior on other inputs based off of a small set of inputs. Mm -hmm. So that's the fundamental challenge, more so than like stochasticity or non-determinism, the way somebody used to thinking about like distributed systems or somebody coming from hardware will think of it as like this thing is fundamentally not controllable. Mm -hmm. um, it's controllable. Um, it's a deterministic program, uh, but we just don't know how to control it. Um, but that doesn't that doesn't change the thrust of your question, I think, which mm -hmm. was like, how do we know like because we have so much trouble like expressing correctness in software for the applications of these models, frequently yeah. it does need to be human evaluation at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at, say, like the self-driving car companies, they don't like automatically release, at least from the people who, have I, who I've seen speak or the materials that I've read, they don't mm -hmm. automatically release changes to models. Humans review information about model behavior before putting them out there. Um, and that's like, you know, multiple layers of human review up from like a sort of larger annotation team or sort of review team that's like many people watching camera feeds all the way up to like a safety review board that reviews a like white paper that expresses these are the failure modes that we used to have that we have gotten rid of. These are the places that we feel we understand well. This is the places that we don't. That's like engineers and product. Uh, managers like sort of synthesizing information into a document for them to read. So that's mm -hmm. like that's like the heaviest weight version of this. Um, mm -hmm. The like lightest weight, you know, you can you can kind of cheat your way at the beginning, and especially if you aren't doing something like operating a multi-ton uh, <laughs> vehicle that might, at high speeds that that like threatens uh, physical safety. You know, if you're just running a chatbot, you can um, you can have LLMs review the outputs. You can right. develop. Like, generally, you want to develop, like, simpler correlates or, mm -hmm. like, kind of little tiny tests that are, like, they regex to check for a particular type of misbehavior of the LLM. Or they, like, compare the LLM's outputs on a known input to good ones from the past, and you look at, like, vector similarity, or you look at keyword overlap, or you, like, use some of these, like, metrics, maybe, like, rouge or blue from NLP that are, like, how close is this text? Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, and then finally, like, yeah, breaking the problem down into smaller problems where it's like, produce a structured output that's like, say, instead of having it write something in a chat, have it like output a structured JSON or XML object that has like, oh, it should have a field for the customer's address. It should have a field for like, what type of support request this is. Um, and like, and then you can evaluate those structured fields because you've sort of like by making the language model output structured objects, you've made it look a little bit more like traditional software where you have control over the over the types. 
Got it. Got it. That's that's very very helpful, insightful. Um, you know, I, I just want to go back to you being a user of model before you joined them. Could you maybe mm-hmm. help us understand what context we use? Were you just running open source models yourself? Like, what were you using them for? Yeah. Um, so that's actually kind of a fun story. Um, mm-hmm. So I was teaching full stack deep learning. This was in 2022. Um, the we were trying to show people get data scientists who wanted to be able to ship stuff mm-hmm. together with like software engineers who wanted to be able to ship ML. Mm-hmm. So that was the sort of like the intersection that was the audience of that class. Mm-hmm. And so we covered everything from like what, you know, what is PyTorch? How do you run stuff on a GPU? Some stuff about this like quality assurance stuff and like how to evaluate ML models was part of the course. Um, and then deployment and like also, you know, iterative improvement, constructing a team, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And the deployment part was one of the parts that I was like most at the end of the class where I felt most unsatisfied on like a technical level. Mm -hmm. Um, And our advice at the time in 2022 was basically try as hard as you can to make the model really small Mm -hmm. so that you can run it on AWS Lambda. It was like or or Google Cloud Run or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was like, if you can't do that, if you can't make your model small enough, like computer vision models which was what was all the rage like in the 2010s when I was in grad school, computer vision models, you train them on GPUs, but you can actually run their inference on like a CPU. You like, I've run them on like Raspberry Pis. Um, And so like, despite the fact that you do need GPUs when you're training models, because there's many opportunities for parallelism that you can take advantage of and accelerate with the GPUs, at inference time, there's less opportunities for parallelism. And so you and like, so the CPU GPU gap tends to go down, um, and models back then were smaller, and so um, you could you could feasibly get them onto CPUs. Uh, but that was kind of unsatisfying to me because some of the coolest models were too big to squeeze onto GPUs, and then, or sorry, to squeeze onto CPUs and run effectively on CPUs. And then there are also many inference applications where if you have sufficient load, you get back the same parallelism opportunities you had in training at inference time. If you have many customers, you can run them, or like many requests, you can run them all at once. And now you're back to having the like benefit to throughput and throughput per dollar even of running them on a GPU. So I felt that that was like pretty unsatisfying. And my experience running things on AWS Lambda and like managing the AD- and the, the like cloud infrastructure in that course was very like, I was like, man, this is bad. <laughs> I do not like this. Mm-hmm. So I looked around for mm-hmm. what, what, what were the infrastructure products that were out there that I could use? I was like, this seems like the sort of thing somebody would make a startup for. So I tried Banana, Replicate, uh, AnyScale, Lightning Cloud, and Modal. Um, mm-hmm. and the one, and I, I actually quite like Replicate. Um, there's lots yeah. of great things about Replicate. Uh, mm-hmm. Banana is now out of business. Um, they were offering a more tightly serverless GPUs only product. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but Modal was the one that I really loved. Like, not only did I have like a good developer experience and I, it was like snappier and faster than yeah. many of the other products I used. It was also like more fully featured. I kept just like, I didn't even realize what I could do if I had an easy way to set up a fast API server. Like I wasn't thinking about that as like and it's sort of like an ML engineer, more of like a back endy person. Um and then and like more of a researcher. Um right. and but modal had this like great thing for setting up fast API apps. And then so I started like launching lots of little fast API apps. The first thing, like kind of larger thing that I built was um I made like a dream booth, which is like yeah. a custom stable diffusion model for my mm-hmm. friends' pets. I was traveling, mm-hmm. I'd sleep on their couch. Grab, get them to send me some pictures of their pets, and I turn it into a little app on modal that was mm-hmm. like, uh, they could they could like ask pictures of of Fido on Mars or you know uh, you know boxer uh, scuba diving, and it would generate mm-hmm. not just a dog scuba diving, but a dog like their dog, mm-hmm. um, and that was like powered by the ability to do fine tuning on modal, and then to turn that into a web service, and that was that like end to end experience. Mm-hmm. And this sudden, like, feeling of superpowers, basically, of like, oh, wow, I can actually make something and not just something that I run in a Jupyter notebook, not just something that, like, I can demo, but actually something that people can use. Uh, yeah. That was the thing that got me, like, really, really excited. And I kept coming back and, build, like, building more things on it. Um, and uh, so after a year of or and change of doing that, I, um, I was like, 
I I should join and uh, like do this for real. Fantastic, fantastic story, very inspiring. Uh, you know, now, as you look at the future of Gen AI and uh, LLMs and multimodal models out there, right? There is uh, a version of the world uh, provided by managed services like OpenAI. And then there is a version of the world which is open source. And model largely powers the open source version of the world, right? Uh, how do you think of this? Is this uh, a world where both coexist? Is this a world where one meets the other? What determines the outcome of that in your opinion? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say that I consider these like ge- like generative models of like important data types, generative models of text, generative models of images and, and audio and video. I consider them like deeply fundamental infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're like akin to programming languages, operating systems and database management systems. Mm-hmm. And if you look at those categories, especially for operating systems and database management systems, um, there and browsers to pick another one. Those are categories in which open source and proprietary technologies are like coexist. Mm-hmm. And over time, as like the composition of the market and as the like low level technical details change and shift, mm-hmm. like sometime like during the nineties, Windows was like the dominant operating system. Nowadays, the like dominant operating system is an open source is open source. It's like Linux and variants. Um uh databases similar story sort of like there are a lot of like there's postgres as this like extremely yep. successful open source technology but there's still oracle sql and sql server all yep. these things yep. driving a lot of value and we're starting to see some difficulty in database companies being able to monetize their open source like um they're like open source database management systems as projects uh, as as managed services due to competition from cloud providers doing the same thing Mm -hmm. so like it like i i I don't think there's some sort of like teleological argument of like everything will become open source or everything will become proprietary yeah i think there will be a mix Mm -hmm. like and one of the key things we can already say is that there are like certain capability levels like the capability level of chat gpt on the day it launched is now a community it's a commodity. Right. It's not a different like that level of cognitive capability or like mm-hmm. knowledge in a in a language model is not a differentiating factor for your business. Mm-hmm. It's like now become like a table stakes commodity. And that is the sort of situation in which you see open source winning. It's like easier to coordinate work around uh, like things that are not the differentiating like competitive edge of businesses. Mm-hmm. And so I think we'll put like Probably the pattern we'll see for some time is going to be that the like leading edge of capabilities will be developed at proprietary labs. And if you mm-hmm. have a task that needs whatever the current leading edge of capabilities is, you'll go to them. Yeah. Um, but everything else, it'll get like slowly accumulated into this collection of like open, openly available capabilities. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of value already to be delivered with the capabilities yeah. of Llama 38B or Llama 370B. Um, and like, I think modal and infrastructure providers like that are an important part of making that yeah. work, um, yeah. and delivering on that value. Mm-hmm. You can, of course, also run your client to talk to open AI. Um, mm-hmm. and the nice thing about that is like later you can switch that to a client that talks to your own language model running on modal. And it's like, you can run an open AI compatible VLLM server or an open, a- open AI compatible llama file server, um, like fairly straightforwardly um and so you now have like it's like a relatively straightforward switch got it got it that's 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 helpful and um you know given the amount of resources the hardware resources it takes to release uh, a competitive uh, foundation model an open source one do you foresee that most of the open source models are going to come out of uh, organizations like a Google and a Facebook, or what other organizations do you think have a fighting chance to release highly competitive foundation models? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the 
yeah, costs are continuing to increase. Mm-hmm. Like the mm-hmm. next generation of models is liable to come out of like 100k H100 clusters, like 100,000 mm-hmm. H100 GPUs interconnected in a single, like effectively a single supercomputer. And that's wow. like the tremendous, this tremendous expense. It's like, yeah, much, much engineering work of the like hard hat variety to say nothing of the like software variety, um, yeah. required to deliver that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that does like, yeah, that does raise an important question of like, at what point does this become completely prohibitively expensive to be done in the like usual manner open source works? Mm-hmm. I'd say it's notable that many like, Postgres is interesting. It was an academic project and just like sort of slowly accumulated contributions over time until it became yeah. this like critical piece of infrastructure. But if you look at the open source databases of the last decade and a half, a lot of them came from inside tech companies, right? Mm-hmm. Like they were, you needed to pay engineer salaries to develop these things and then the company would open source it once it became no longer like differentiating yeah, value. Like Hadoop, Hadoop and all of that. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah. And s- sometimes it was like, oh, they like sort of solved a bunch of engineering problems. And then once you had the basic architecture down, you could sort of like make a copy of it straightforwardly. And we don't really have that with um, the way generative models are created. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll say the, the like fundamental economic phenomenon of like actually open AI doesn't actually care about hiding the weights of GPT-3 anymore. Right. Mm-hmm. GPT three and probably also even like text da Vinci three and the model that under that was underneath like chat GPT. Mm-hmm. Like say, like the, the leadership of open AI has, has made statements of like, oh yeah, we'd love to open source this thing. It's like my read on it is that it's like organizationally complex to do so, that there's mm-hmm. like legal concerns, yada yada. And it's not actually really about trying to protect IP. Because the real IP, the model is not the moat, right? The weights, these like pile of floating point numbers, there's utility in them. There's like, and there's maybe some intellectual property that can be like backfilled out of it. But honestly, that model was trained like four years ago. It's, it doesn't have many like good ideas that have yeah. been developed since. Right. And so that's that once you get to the point where they're non-differentiating, it's like, oh, yeah, let's just let's open source it. Let's release it. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So I think many of the open source, I, I would expect as this like field sticks around and matures that we start to see more like. Previously, proprietary models become open source. Or if not literally that, it's like, oh, like, you know, they redid the training so that they could have a clean, distinct artifact to open source, right? Yeah. And that's like, it's like a hundred times cheap, like, because it's a few generations back, it's a hundred times cheaper than their current training run. And so it's like a not noticeable line item. And it's not like, it's not harming the differentiating, like, competitiveness of their business. And it like, starts to draw people in if you create an open source community around developing on top of these people will build tools that you can use for your other more advanced models your it's like training it's all the general usual arguments you'd see for open sourcing um i don't necessarily expect that like i don't know the governments or that like uh typical non-tech fortune 500 companies would be creating these things for themselves in the same mm-hmm. way that you don't see like walmart releasing an open source database management system Mm-hmm. Like they have like highly capable people like working on the internals of database management systems, but they don't tend to create open source artifacts. Right. Um, and like, yeah, so sort of, like social cultural things and sort of like where is the emphasis of the business? Um, but you do see like Databricks. It's not just Google. It's and it's not just the like new wave of startups releasing these. You also you do see them coming from Snowflake, Databricks, et cetera. So like, yeah, I think there's there will be. A ver- like a variety of tech forward institutions releasing openly available models. That's very well said. I think Salesforce released one last week. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. There's also a tremendous like the um there's a tremendous number of like high quality models coming out of the uh like the Chinese language modeling community. And they also do well in English because there's lots of English text on the internet. You kind of need a lot of that if you want to do stuff in code. Like most, lots of code has like comments and yeah. code, like the names of variables are in English. And so they end up actually creating like Quen is like a very high quality language yeah. model, like goes toe to toe with Gemma 2 and the Llama series of models. And that is, um, it remains like you know remains to be seen what happens there. I have less insight into that 
like yeah. community and how things are built there, but we can already see empirically that they've built great stuff. Um, and there's like some definite, definite opportunities there. Um, but looking forward to seeing what happens there in the coming years. Awesome. Yeah. And as a ML engineer yourself, how has the way you code changed over the last 24 months? How much of the projects you work on, um, is kind of LLM generated code? How, how has that changed your life? Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, the biggest change for me is that I have moved away from, you know, writing low level, you know, like PyTorch, like custom models myself. Like mm-hmm. that used to be the way things were. I spent a lot of time, like not too far from the, like not too far from the GPU. Um, and the last two years has been like a steady march upward of like, oh, let me use this via tra- like, the transformers interface instead of like lightning and pytorch um and oh actually you know there's interfaces built on top of transformers there's like accelerate now there's axolotl on top of that for llm fine tuning and like sort of moving up the stack as people start to like kind of figure out what the right abstractions are at each level and offer them as packages so that's just sort of and then additionally like now that this technology is now that you can start with a foundation a pre-trained foundation model and deliver something useful with a very small amount of found, fine tuning. The like for any given product budget of like time and effort, you can get further in deploying it. So now I find myself like doing a lot more work on like standing up user interfaces, on like create on like running databases to support applications that have LLMs or have generative models in them. So it's just sort of like I've kind of ridden this wave up the stack towards mm-hmm. like um application development and deployment um but uh you also asked about the um like generated code um mm-hmm. i do tend to use language models quite a bit like copilot for like doing lots of boilerplate like write a quick comment that's that's mm-hmm. like the thing that i want to do next at a high level in english and then like yeah. it generates some code um, the utility for me has been the ability to like jump more effectively across the stack. Like mm. I'm a Python person, um, yeah. like, like a little bit of Haskell, but not like, yeah, the, and a little, like a little bit of Rust, a little bit of JavaScript, but I'm not like super comfortable in those languages. You put me in front of a whiteboard and I had to like write out code that would compile and run in those, mm. in any language for Python, it, it would mm. not go well. But if mm. I have a language model to like give me the scaffolding that I then yeah. change, or to take something I find on Stack Overflow and adjust it for my current purpose, or to explain a stack trace, or to explain how to use a tool, like, oh, wait, I don't understand what cargo build is doing here, or I don't understand, like, what's going on with this webpack thing? Like, why is this failing? The All these things that used to be, like, blockers that would take a long time to resolve have yeah. gone, like, a magnitude or two down um, mm-hmm. with LMs, and that allows you to be a mediocre software developer in far more languages, even if it doesn't make you a great software developer in any of them. And so that's been like, uh, kind of, it's changed the like ambition of the projects that I take on. It's like, yeah, I could totally use a new, like, I'll use the async version of Django on this project. Like, if I run into any problems, I'll just ask ChatGPT for help. And, yeah. and like, I, I would be more careful doing that if I were running like super, like, for, for stuff that's like, super serious modal internal things i'm a little bit more cautious about just raw using which model outputs but i still do find very helpful for doing those things um but yeah makes sense and just a last question um uh charles just given your again your background as an educator and as a practitioner right now right earlier the audience to whom you taught data science was basically data scientists uh, today, it seems as if every developer is going to be some kind of an AI developer from a front end to a tester to everybody. So there's the audience of data scientists to whom you teach AI. Now there's a new audience of all developers want to learn that. And then there's a third audience of business users teaching them to prompt AI. Where do you think the largest challenges and opportunities lie in these three segments? And is there another segment I'm missing out on? No, I think those are, those are great segments. I think. We will see more things develop. I, 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 I don't think we've seen the last of like how this world is going to develop. For example, mm-hmm. like I would expect in a couple of years, 
code generation to be good enough that we get end user programming of applications where like rather than running like full featured clients of like like Zoom, you and I are both running approximately the same program on our computers. Mm -hmm. Um, That's only because it costs so much to write programs. If Mm -hmm. the cost of writing programs goes down by like at a certain quality level goes down by like two or three orders of magnitude then you and I would both have distinct Zoom clients, effectively, like distinct programs to run that give us the features that we want and not the features we don't, and that we can adjust at any time by, like, requesting changes. That's, like, an, an, an elaboration of this, like, prompting and interacting with a chatbot, but it's sufficiently different that I expect it to feel very different and require, like, very different coaching and teaching, sort of, like, a little bit of management, a little bit of, like, high-level technical explanations of, like, what are you exactly asking for Um, from these things, sort of like a lot of the kinds of things that technical managers of technical teams need to learn. Um, So that would be the only vertical I would add. Um, For the other three, I think teaching people to prompt, teaching people to use these models, I expect that to be done very informally in general. Like that's something where like mid journey achieved like sort of education of their users by putting them all in a discord chat together so they'd see each other run prompts, right? Like they were just like, if you didn't pay for it, everybody could just yeah. see your point. And that became this like community of people. They would be like, oh, sick. That's a cool trick. Like mush two artists' name. This is one of my favorites. Mush two artists' names together in English, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, you know, Vincent Van Vermeer, right? Mm-hmm. Like squish that together. And all of a sudden you've got this like, like mixed together art style. And wow. that's something that I like, saw somebody do in one of these like forums where people were like, prompting and I picked it up and now like mm-hmm. I tell that to people I like will use it and people will notice and it sort of diffuses so I don't see that that's not necessarily a business opportunity there's like some small there's always opportunities for education and consulting um, but it's not a big one um, I think the bigger opportunity is as you alluded to getting software engineers to learn a bunch of these skills uh, of data scientists mm-hmm. uh, and that's like they need to learn data centrism, they need to learn things about evaluation, they need to learn things about how to handle the like kind of mushiness of unstructured text and un- and unstructured image outputs. It requires a, like quite different orientation to application building. Yeah, I do think it's possible for one like persona to have both of those skill sets. Um, I think it took me a long time to develop both of those skill sets. But that's also because like the technology was not really there yet. And like, you know, the as the tooling improves and as the abstractions improve, you have to learn less to be able to do that. So right. I would expect, like, one, the, like, data scientists graduate, like, people in sort of, like, a data science-y, uh, like, undergraduate major to come out with more deployment skills and, like, a tighter orientation to running, like, pre-trained models and evaluating the behavior of models. Um, and, like, they just pick that up in school. Um and they pick that up from interacting with these systems. So, like, intermediate term, that's, like, a change I expect to see in, like, new grads and new hires. Um, then, uh, like, software engineers from playing with these, like, like professional software engineers from playing with these systems, from trying to solve these evaluation problems, will learn those things. That's the place where I see a larger opportunity if you are, like, I'm no longer, I like, as somebody who works at Modal, I'm, like, primarily in sort of a developer advocacy, developer relations position for this particular product. But if I were in a situation of needing to teach people, um, like, or if running a, like, education business, um, or if I were in the position of needing to, like, educate a large engineering team at an enterprise, that would be the thing that I would focus on. It's, like, how do you get this, like, data literacy is what Hamil Hussein calls it. Um, uh, like to a broad set of software engineers. I, I definitely think it's possible, but it's, um, you know, uh, takes, takes some effort, takes a, like, we, weeks to months of, of training. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you so much on, on that note. Uh, really appreciate it. This was terrific. Tons of insights. Uh, thanks for your time. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Benny.